everyone. Welcome to a new episode of The Winning Post, brought to you in association with the Serum Institute of India. I'm Mohit Lalvani, and as always, there's plenty on the show. Let's take a look at what the headlines have in store for you. First up in our new segment, we take a look at the Bangalore City Gold Cup, and with that, a look at the Chairman's Trophy, as well as the Juvenile Championship from Singapore. Plus a look at the results from the Shirga Cup, which took place on the 10th of August, as well as the latest World Thoroughbred Rankings. In our educational segment, we learn about the importance of bandaging and saddling a horse. Wait, start and stop at the top. And finally, moving back to the home turf, we catch up with trainer Suleiman Atole in Bangalore. Well, let's kick off this episode right at the top with the Kingfisher Trailblazers. The Group 3 Bangalore City Gold Cup on the second last weekend of racing of the Bangalore summer season 2013 attracted six horses into the parade ring for the contest that would be run over a trip of 1200 meters. In the field was runner-up of Group 2 the Ambrosia BTC Anniversary Cup Archibaldo trained by Prasanna Kumar. He came into the contest with a record of six wins from 14 starts, which included the Dharma Prakash LS Venkaji Rao Memorial Cup on June 4th, as well as the YS Sundar Memorial Cup on June 29th, both over 1400 meters. The seven-year-old had jockey S. John riding him. The field also included Speed 6 from S. Padmanabhan Stable. He had run second at the Group 3 Chief Minister's Cup before running fourth at Group 2 the Ambrosia BTC Anniversary Cup. The Vijay Malia owned runner had the Kingfisher Bangalore Derby winning jockey A. Sandesh on his back. The Suleiman Ataullahi train Sovetskaya came into the contest on the back of a win at the HP Gundapa Gauda Memorial Cup on July 6. His record included six wins of 19 starts and with Suraj Naredu riding him, looked confident of securing another victory here. Archibaldo scorched the field with a timing of 1 minute 13.38, with Speed 6 and Sovetskaya following respectively. Well, here on the Winning Post, it's our endeavour to bring you horse racing from all over the world. Last week, we brought you the RWITC Cup, which was hosted in Singapore. Well, let's stay in Singapore for a bit, which is where I am, and bring you the Juvenile Championship as well as the Chairman's Trophy. Nine runners entered the parade ring to participate in the Group 2 Chairman's Trophy over 1800 metres on turf. In the field was David Hill trained Flax who was stepping up in trip from 1400 metres to 1800 metres. The seven-year-old had Baron Vorster riding him and was looking to improve on his disappointing runs in the Group 1 SIA Cup in May of this year and at the Open over 1400 metres on the 7th of July. He was a horse with plenty of talent but was often dogged by overheating issues during his races. The Michael Friedman trained Nandora was also in the lineup and came into this contest on the back of win at the Group 3 UT Classic Stakes on the 5th of July, enough to provide him with the maximum crowd support in the markets. He was ridden by jockey Manuel Nunes. Michael Friedman also had another runner in Always Certain, who too was stepping up in trip from 1400 meters to 1800 meters, something he would enjoy. He had placed fourth last time out in an open over 1400 meters on July 7th and had the infirm apprentice jockey Aisuri on his back. Length and a half away to Flax, the outside of Wild Geese in danger of getting pocketed here as they go by the 600. Next of all, Deep Pockets around the outside from last year's winner, Chase Me. Then came Fat Kid, always certain, Tenzing into the stretch they come. 400 metres out and Nandara up on the outside, testing, ready to strike. Flax is running on, Wild Geese behind them from Chase Me, always certain down the outside. Nandara the leader, the little fella, Flax is coming to him, gets on terms as they go by the furlong marker. Flax Nandara. Dara fighting it out, always certain down the outside, Flax about a neck in front, Dan Dara coming back on the rails, Flax trying to cling on, he's going to do it, Flax will take the chairman's trophy, Flax by a neck. It was redemption time for Flax as he galloped away to the finish line to clinch the $300,000 winner's share in 1 minute 48.04. 
He's by Silvano and has taken his earnings to over one million dollars with this win. The Group 3 Juvenile Championship on the 28th of July saw eight two-year-olds come into the parade ring for the contest to be run over a distance of 1,200 meters on turf. The field included War Affair, who came into the contest on the back of two wins from three starts. The Mark Walker trained three-year-old enjoyed the lion's share of the market support and had jockey Joe Marrera partnering him. His wins included the Group 2 Oz Horse Golden Horseshoe on the 17th of May and the English Sydney Juvenile Stakes Open on the 3rd of that month. Challenging him was Desert Fox from Michael Friedman's yard. The three-year-old was making the third start of his career and was unbeaten coming into this one. His victories included an Open for two-year-olds over 1,000 metres on the 7th of July and the Speed Baby 2011 Stakes Novice on June 30th. He was ridden by Alan Munro. Desert Fox's stablemate Peace No War came into the contest on the back of two wins from three starts, which included a win on debut at the Group 2 Magic Millions Mr. Big Stakes in April. His other win was in the Hollow Spain Stakes graduation on the 14th of July, and with Manuel Nunes in the saddle was expected to run a big one. Also joining them in the parade ring was Silver Dollar, who had run behind Desert Fox in the open for two-year-olds and behind War Affair in the Group 2 Oz Horse Golden Horse Shoe. The Sam Chua trained coach had John Powell on his back to guide him home. In the Juvenile Championship, Hot Aristocrat came away quite well of War Affair, the favourite, and Peace No War with plenty of acceleration and now Rapport trying to race him. But across from the outside, Peace No War into the first corner, led over Rapport. Three lengths away to War Affair, down on the inside as they turn off the back. Next, Rapport going up wider from Easy Money. Next of all, then, is Hot Aristocrat, who was first out of the gates, but he's back in about sixth or seventh position to his inside Desert Fox. And last of all is Silver Dollar. Down the side they come and Peace No War the leader. Nunez tried to get a cheap sectional here as they go by the 600 metres. He let a half length over a poor the outsider. The favourite War Affair just locked up behind them as they turned for home from Mexpra Boy. Then came Easy Money, Hot Aristocrat over on the inside Desert Fox and behind them is Silver Dollar but inside the final 300 metres and War Affair got the split between horses, went up to Peace No War. Rapport just struggling a little bit. Hot Aristocrat Desert Fox in behind them. War Affair the leader sticking on strongly. Peace No War over on the inside. It's War Affair, Peace No War. Desert Fox running on late. War Affair just in front. Desert Fox coming at him quickly. They hit it tight. War Affair or Desert Fox in the juvenile. Very little between them. War Affair reigned supreme again when he beat the field in a timing of 1 minute 10.29. The son of O'Reilly from Christique has won his connections over... 3 million Singapore dollars with this win. The Longines World's Best Racehorse Rankings were updated on the 4th of August. Even three months after retirement, Philly Black Caviar raked up the top position with a rating of 130. Winner of the King George VI and Queen Elizabeth Stakes Novelist came in a close second with a rating of 128. Toronado, who recently won the Kipco Sussex Stakes, came in fourth with a rating of 126, while his nemesis Dawn Approach came sixth in a tie with winner of Dubai World Cup, Animal Kingdom, fourth rating at 125. Triple Group 1 winner Al Kazim raked up the 10th place, tying up with SIA Cup winner Military Attack with a rating of 124.
Well, it's time for a short break here on the Winning Post. And when we come back, well, we'll go behind the scenes into the stables to see what a horse goes through, well, before race time. <laughs> Welcome back to the winning post and moving right along we did mention when we went away for our break that well a horse has to go through a process before it gets ready for the races. Well have you ever wondered what it takes to bandage a horse I can tell you it's quite an art. Here at Steve Burge's stable what we're going to take a look at is the importance of bandaging a horse before it actually goes out into race. I've got Jackie with me and uh, she's actually taking the bandage right through and uh, Jackie now is, this is this is more for protection than anything else isn't it? Protection and support. Um, sometimes the races can get a bit rough and the horses can get galloped on and it does give them just a little bit of protection from things like that. Um, and the tension of the bandage also hold, helps hold the legs together. Horses that are coming back from injuries, it's always a good idea to put a bandage on just to give them a bit more support when they're galloping. Now when you're putting a bandage on like this, um, uh, where do you start, where, where, where do you stop to ensure that flexion is at no stage compromised? Always start and stop at the top. You start at the top, you go all the way down and keep the tension even throughout and then you go back up and finish where you start. And you know, Obviously, there's, there are hazards with uh, tying a bandage too tight as well, right? You've got to be, I mean, you really have to know what you're doing here. Very much so. Um, bandaging should always be done by a more experienced member of staff. If you put them on too tight, you can actually cause a bow in the tendon, um, which is very similar to a training injury. You know, obviously, the uh, fact that a senior staff needs to do it, and you've uh, you know, got to get the consistency between the uh, left fore and the right fore. That, that's important as well, isn't it? Yeah, of course. When you're bandaging anything, you've got to make sure that it's the same. You know, when you're bandaging a horse for a race, does it get complicated? Do you often have to uh, put it on, take it off? I mean, does that happen too often? Not if you know what you're doing now. Well, all right. We saw him getting his bandages done. It's time now for us to uh, see him get saddled. And Steve's going to just take us through it as he's doing it. Yeah, not all trainers, but a lot of trainers use a breastplate, and we, we like to use breastplates on our horses because you never know when saddles may slip for one reason or another. So we put a breastplate on. It does help if a, you know if the saddle does shift back to sort of keep the jockey or the track rider on. So we always put on all our horses a, a breastplate. So we start off with that, and then we go. We have a piece of packing that we put on on the on the horse's uh, body and skin. We put that on. It's a bit of a non-slip, so we put that on next, and then we we like to put a, another piece of packing. Just to, you've got to have plenty of packing on without too much, because you have too much that the saddle can roll. But you don't want to give. You want to have enough packing on so the horse doesn't get a sore back. Because once they get a sore back, it is you know you have it does take a while to sort of for a horse to uh, you know to sort of for it to come right. So then we put a, another piece of palling packing on. I like to use a lot of Pallings, he's a, an ex-jockey in Australia and he's gone into uh, making packing and we find it's a good, it's a good packing to put on a horse. Uh, after that we have to put the number cloth on to keep in the rules of racing in, in what, Singapore. So this horse's number is F205, it, it goes on. And that helps him get identified as well, right? Yeah, yeah, all the, the track people can see it and, and just anyone in general so and then we've, we've got these other pieces of packing here which is like quite a thick bit of sponge and it's sort of we put that over the top of the number cloth and under the saddle we find tend to find it it's very good for, for you know for sort of keeping soreness away from them then we go ahead and we put the the saddle over the top always try to make sure that the saddle lines up with the back of the all in line because it's no good having packing out the back end of the saddle and you like to have a bit of a bit of packing in front of the saddle to grip in. So then we put it together and Jackie's over the other side, she puts the um, the girth onto the, 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 the straps, the leather straps and then we tighten the horse up, make sure it's in the right position. Stand up. He gets a bit agitated and thinks he's going to go out. I do it up my side, not all the way, and then Jackie can take it up on her side. 
to make sure it's tight on both sides. She's taking it up, so then I just might take it up one more hole if I think it needs going up, which it does just without cutting him in half. I give it a bit of a stretch, and we use a rubber girth line underneath. We tend to find that it just sort of stops them from bruising under the stomach because um, if you bruise them, then you know it's, it's uncomfortable for them, and then it takes a little while to sort of get the bruising, you know, bruising right. Then we do up the sur single. Put that on, and then the horse is all saddled, ready to go. Well, and it truly requires a lot of practice, and the bandages, of course, are important in a race as well as in track work because it protects the horse, but of course, you have to do it correctly. On that note, we take a short break and come right back. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Welcome back to the Winning Post. It's time now for our Get to Know Your Racing Pro brought to you by the Serum Institute of India. As you're aware, the life of a trainer, well, every day is a Monday. I couldn't say any more. Suleiman Atale tells us the rest of the story. Today, the guest on our show is Mr. S.S. Atalahi, who's been around for six years now, but has been fairly successful leading in horses from the Malia stables. Here's a chat with Suleiman Atolahi. Suleiman, your start has been sedate. You've had a fair amount of success. Going is getting better in this particular season. Let us begin from where you started off. My father and my grandfather were both racehorse trainers. Uh, from a very young age, uh, I would visit the, the stables with him. So I think that's where it all started. And uh, I got my basic riding lesson from Bari here in Bangalore. We had to move to Pune. The family had to move to Pune, and for unforeseen circumstances, I could not complete my education. Uh, I think this is in '95 or '96. That's when Nanuli was being uh, start, cast, conceived and started. I happened to bump into Dr. Ravi Reddy there, and uh, uh, I always wanted to be a vet which did not happen. So, um, uh, I thought I would learn by working with a vet. When, we, when I went to Nanoli, the intention was to just get the basic education from a vet, learn practically. At the root level. At the root level. But things were very different over there. Um, uh, they were breaking in yearlings, they had an aqua treadmill, uh, they had uh, horse walkers. So it was a totally different experience for me. That's where I gained my basic uh, horse education from. Basically, when I went there, um, they wanted me to start from scratch, which I did. And over a period of time, uh, I grew to be uh, the, wind, uh, the windling manager over there. James Underwood, he, uh, makes, an annual, he makes an annual trip uh, during the winters. And, uh, he uh, was generally asking me what I wanted to do, what my future plans were. So I had mentioned to him that I do want to become a racehorse trainer, but uh, in, the, in this business you need a godfather. You need somebody to support you and somebody to give you that break and opportunity. Uh, unfortunately, it was not viable for Nanoli Start Farm and Mr. Danji Boy to uh, uh, give me that break as a trainer. Though the thought had crossed his mind. That's where it all, you know, started. And I think six months later or a year later, uh, Mr. Dhariwal was looking for an assistant. So I got in touch with him. But they were having some changes in their organization. So when Mr. Zain Mirza came in as the racing manager for URBB, uh, that's when I was called for an interview and spoke across the table. And then I went back to Mr. Danji Boy, got his blessings and took up this job. It's been a very long, bumpy ride, but uh, it's that the, the thrill, the, the, when your horse passes the winning post, it's that thrill which uh, makes you forget everything. The aches and the pains and the trouble and everything is whitewashed by that, that one moment. I'm very lucky to have uh, Mr. Zain Mirza, uh, who uh, has given me the opportunity and you know he comes once in two, three weeks, has a look at the horses, 
Hasnain comes, has a look at the horses. Uh, Pacey is here during the summer season. So, you know, you, you get to pick up things from these people. You learn from these people. Even your start was a little, uh, you know, rushed into because Dharival was unwell when you took over the horses in uh, Bombay. Uh, I, I had just joined in Bombay. Uh, Mr. Dhariwal had a bypass, he was unwell. So, uh, Pacey, Pacey was managing the yard. He was obviously in uh, talking to Mr. Dhariwal and you know, they were doing things together. But physically, Mr. Dhariwal wasn't there. So, my first six months were with Pacey. And uh, that's where my discipline comes from. He's a very hard taskmaster. And uh, uh, I'm thankful for that. Because that has got that discipline into me. See, Mr. Dhariwal is a, 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 is, a, is a very good trainer. Mr. Dhariwal gave me the opportunity to do things on my own. In the sense, he gave me the freedom. Once he got the confidence in me, he you know, taught, taught me certain things. He, uh, I got to know his pattern of training. I understood what he looks you know, in horses, what, when to look for races for them. The basics in uh, every trainer has a particular pattern. So, he, Mr. Dhariwala also has played a very big role in this because he had given me the opportunity. What was it like when you started off on your own, now success more regularly? When did that start happening? Uh, like I said, first six months, uh, I had my first winner 10th of June 2007. After that, I was not winning races, but horses were running second and third. So, it was a cause of big worry. But the following season, the winter, it was better than the first six months because I had five, six winners during that season and uh, the young the younger horses were in the two year olds had come in so somehow we managed to pull off a, 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 a great a great three win in hyderabad so over a period of time as you get horses as you get good horses uh, uh, with experience you tend to learn from the mistakes you've made in the past there's no particular success mantra actually there's no particular pattern of for horses to when you train them you have to treat them individually similarly we don't intend for them to, you know, keep galloping and winning races and then there's a gap. We want them to do well throughout consistently. So, um, again, you have the luck factor in. So, I just think, uh, it all, it's, again, there are too many variables into this. How, how is it with the colleagues? You know, there's a lot of rivalry on race days and stuff like that. No, I, uh, we are all very... Uh, uh, we are friends. Most of our colleagues are very nice. They are friends. Uh, sometimes they come and advise us that they feel that we are doing certain things wrong. They come and tell us what we should do and what we should not do. That is in their opinion. Uh, rivalries on the track is when your horses run. But otherwise, we are all uh, we have a good time. Especially in the summer season, we play cricket. You know, when we have all the outstation trainers here, jockeys here. So it's it's like a big family. Yeah. Suleiman, there's so much of travel involved in uh, your profession. You are in Delhi one day, Calcutta one day, Bombay one day. You have a family life too. So how does your wife cope with your absence? Uh, yeah, we do a bit of traveling, but not not that often. It's at different times of the year, depending on what horses you have. So uh, yeah, you miss out on your family life because it's like a 24/7 job, and uh, the time you're working your family is at home and the time you are at home your family is working so yeah i am very thankful to my family for being um, the backbone to uh, to support me you know to uh, to bear with me and to you know understand uh, what sort of business i am in any last word you want to say just one thing is that uh, uh, hard work pays honesty pays you be honest and you do your work the right way, success will follow. This was told to me by many senior trainers, which you know I thought what these guys are saying, I don't see it happening. But now over a period of time it it seems to be happening. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Well, and that's all we have on this episode of The Winning Post. As always, thanks for joining us. Do remember, you can follow me at Mohit Lalvani on Twitter and even come onto our Facebook page, which is www.facebook.com slash winningpostracing, as well as our YouTube site, www.youtube.com slash winningpostracing. Thanks for joining me. Till I see you in a week's time. Goodbye, and as always, may the horse be with you.